everybody hear me okay? All right, good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank everyone for the invitation down here. When Dave first contacted me last year and asked me if I'd be interested in coming to this area to, to speak at this conference, I gladly accepted. And I did that because, one, I'd never been here before. But the other reason was that I was already familiar with the conference. This conference is getting a name as one of the premier soil health events in the country. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today. I want to tell you right up front that I am in no way here to tell you how you should or shouldn't run your operation. That's only for you to decide. I'm only here with you to share the story of my family and I and how we've journeyed down this path of focusing on regenerative agriculture and focusing on our soils. So what I'm going to do is just share with you this morning that story and then during the breakout sessions over the next day and a half, I'm going to get more in depth on what we do on our operation to focus on land regeneration. So our operation is located right outside of Bismarck, North Dakota and I had to show a scene from the, the summer on our ranch because yesterday on the drive up here, I could only imagine how beautiful this country must be during the summer. And I wanted to show you that we can be beautiful in the, in the summer back home, but we can also be a bit cold during the winter. Uh, this shows, and I just wanted to show it to you so you know, it can get cold elsewhere other than here. Uh, that's average days below freezing. That's Bismarck on the right, 223 days a year we're below freezing. Now so often when people hear North Dakota, they think of scenes like this, and that's not a herd of muskox. That's my 350 cow-calf pairs grazing cover crops at 40 degrees below zero wind chill. And they do just fine on it. And driving up here yesterday, I noticed a large amount of livestock, which is encouraging as we'll discuss in the next day and a half, but there's a real opportunity to use those livestock to regenerate your soils. So what does Bismarck, North Dakota have in common with this area? Well, the answer is soil. We all have soil, and that's the common denominator. As Mike said, I've had the good fortune to talk all over North America, and this is the common theme that we all have. It's also the reason I can stand in front of you today and tell you with 100% certainty that the principles that the speakers here in the next day and a half are going to share with you will work on your operation. Because they're simply the principles of nature and they work everywhere in the world where there's production agriculture. So a little bit about the history of our operation. The ranch I'm on was founded by my in-laws in 1956, and they farmed it from 1956 until 1991 when my wife and I purchased a part of it from them. Now, Bismarck, North Dakota area, we get about 10 to 11 inches of rainfall a year and another five or so inches from the, from the snow. So we get about 16 inches of total precip a year. We're 100% dry land. There's no irrigation in the area. Now, my in-laws for years, the 35 years they operated the operation, the cropland acres, of which there's about 2,000, they farmed with extensive tillage. And it was half summer follow, half crop. They rested the cropland every other year. They only grew small grains, primarily spring wheat, a little bit of barley, a little bit of oats, all in monocultures. And they used a lot of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, it was more or less what many call conventional agriculture. <coughs> now, I was fortunate in 1991 when I purchased that operation that, that we did some baseline soils work. And we found that the organic matter levels on the cropland were from 1.7 to 1.9%. Now, historically speaking, soil scientists tell me that area of pre-European settlement was in the 7 to 8% range. So in other words, we had burned off over 75% of the carbon in the soils due to management over the years. I was also fortunate that NRCS came out and they did some baseline infiltration studies on our soils. And they found out we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour, which meant any time we get a thunderstorm that often dumps an inch or two of rain, we were going to lose most of it. And it wasn't going to be able to infiltrate in the soil profile. So that was key. Now, the grazing system, there was only three pastures. It was season-long grazing. The, calves, the cows were calved in the corral, 
Then they were moved out to those pastures for the summer grazing season. They ran on crop aftermath a little while, and then they were fed about six months out of the year. Uh, when we purchased that operation, we could run about 65 cow-calf pairs and 20 yearlings. Today, we've taken that to where now we run 350 cow-calf pairs. We have a flock of sheep, we have pastured hogs, we have laying hens, we have broilers, and many other enterprises, which I'll discuss tomorrow. So we've been able to stack enterprises in order to regenerate the, the resource, plus put more dollars in our pocket. Now, when we purchased that in 1991, we continued to till. And for the first couple of years, we tilled the soil and we farmed conventionally. We didn't expand the crop rotation. Then in 1994, I had a good friend in the northern part of the state who was a no-till. And he told me, Gabe, you need to go no-till in order to save time and moisture. We thought those were our limiting factors. But he said, I'm going to give you some advice. If you go no-till, sell all your tillage equipment so you're never tempted to go back. And as a young producer, I actually had to do that. I sold my tillage equipment so I could buy this no-till drill. And we've been 100% zero-till ever since. Now also in 1994, I started to diversify the rotation a little bit. And we added, these are field peas, we added those to the rotation. Field peas grow well in North Dakota. And the reason I did that, above every acre of land, there's approximately 34,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. Well, as a farmer, that's free to us if we plant legumes in the rotation so they can utilize some of that free nitrogen and put it in the soil where we can then utilize it. Well, 1995 came along, and the day before I was going to start combining, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. Now, I didn't carry any hail insurance at that time because my in-laws had farmed there for 35 years and had only hailed twice, but not to a large extent. Well, this was pretty devastating on us and because we lost our entire crop income. Well, that fall, I had to think, okay, how am I going to generate some dollars? So that was my first year that I planted this combination, winter triticale and hairy batch. They're both fall biannuals. I did a little research, what could I plant in the fall so I could get some money quicker by harvesting that crop. I also wanted to take advantage of nature. In nature, mycorrhizal fungi will move nitrogen from the legume into the grass plant, and it'll move phosphorus from the grass into the legume. So why not take advantage of these simple principles of nature? So I started to do that in the fall of 95. 1996 came along, and, and we were able to pay the interest back to the bank, but we weren't able to pay all the principal, but they stuck with it. They were a lot more uh, stringent on their loan requirements, but they stuck with us. Well, we added corn to the rotation to try and expand our marketing opportunities and diversify the rotation. Unfortunately, we lost 100% of our crop to hail again. Well, by then, things were really starting to get tough. My wife and I both took off farm jobs, and, and uh, you know, we, we did have some livestock, so we were able to start, we were able to pay the principal, the interest back to the bank, but not the principal. 1997 came along, and it was a very dry year in our area. Nobody combined an acre. So once again, we didn't have crop income. So that made three years in a row with no crop income. We were fortunate enough, we were able to scrounge enough hay together to keep the cow herd intact, but it was a pretty lean year. 1998 came along, and you can about guess what, what that brought. That is a picture from our operation, and we lost 80% of our crop to hail. So that was four years in a row with no crop income. Things were looking pretty tough financially. I was really fortunate in the fact that the bank did not have a mortgage on the land. We had the land on a contract for deed with my in-laws, so we knew we weren't going to get foreclosed on there. And the bank probably looked at it, well, all this guy owns is a no-till drill and a 3020 tractor and old 4440, so they probably decided what the heck, we'll just leave them out there. But things were really tough, and after that hailstorm, I needed feed for the livestock, so I went in and started planting sedan grass, but I added to that things like cow peas, because it's a legume, it's going to fix nitrogen. I couldn't afford to write checks for these synthetic inputs, so I had to figure ways, how am I going to get the soil to produce and grow a crop without it? 
Now I want to say right up front, I had no idea what soil health was at that time. You know, it just uh, didn't even occur to me. I was just trying to survive and keep the banker at bay. What I did do, though, with this crop, because, because it was costly to go out there and to hay it and put up the hay, we started to do a little livestock integration, and we actually let the livestock graze that crop in late in the fall and into the winter. So I was starting to integrate livestock on the cropland without even really knowing what I was doing. Now I did notice one thing through that time, we were starting to notice that the organic matter levels were slowly moving up. And you can imagine three years of hail and then a year of drought, that crop residue wasn't really removed, the roots weren't being disturbed with tillage, so our organic matter levels were slowly starting to inch up. Well, I came to the realization that what I had really been doing was eroding my topsoil due to tillage in my farming practices. Ray Archuleta put this slide together, and I think it, it's really fitting. What this is, it depicts a person who took a forested area, and they cleared part of that forested area, and then they farmed it monoculture for 17 years with tillage. That's the same soil. I so wish I would have had the foresight to archive my soils when I started moving down this path, because I tell you, my soils look exactly like the soils on the right. There was no pore spaces that Jay talked about. The soil was compacted. It could infiltrate water. There was no life in the soil. There was no carbon in the soil. If you take a closer look at those soils, what you really see is that lack of pore spaces. And Jay talked about it with this demonstration. Which, take a look at that demonstration right now. What do you see? It's destroyed. If there's no pore spaces, that soil is destroyed. It, it, there's no glue left to hold it together. Versus the soil on your right, look at how that's still holding together after all this time. And you can watch that throughout the day, and I'll guarantee you at the end of the day that pet on the right will still be there. I have destroyed my soils due to my management practices. What's worth says, and this is Jay's favorite saying, we had really come to accept a degraded resource. As producers, we think, that's the way my soils are, just live with it. We don't have to do that. Besides that, we'd seen a lot of symptoms of that degraded resource. I noticed that I was having to add more and more synthetic fertilizer over time in order to get the same amount of yield. I was seeing a lot of these symptoms, and that's all these are, is symptoms. And you can probably look at that list and find one or two that your operation may see. But all they are is symptoms. They're symptoms of a greater problem. And those symptoms end us up costing us as producers a lot of dollars. So we need to focus on how we can get rid of those symptoms. 1997, I had the opportunity to attend my first holistic management training. And there was a producer from Canada, Don Campbell. He's a rancher up there. And he made this statement, and it really stuck with me. He said, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And I'll never forget when he said that at that conference, because it just hit me. I was in my third year of, of crop failure. And I got thinking, I really need to change how I'm looking at things if I want to survive and stay on the farm. I came to the realization the greatest roadblock in solving a problem is the human mind. And I know there's some of you out there are sitting there, ah, this works in North Dakota, but it won't work on my place. It will work on your place. I'm 100% confident of that. It's just up to you to use the principles in the manner to allow nature to heal itself. So we really need to focus on solving problems and not treating symptoms. That's going to put more dollars in our pocket and it's going to leave our resources regenerated for the next generation. So how do we improve soil health? I found the answer in the 2008 in order to get the same amount of yield. I was seeing a lot of these symptoms, and that's all these are, is symptoms. And you can probably look at that list and find one or two that your operation may see. But all they are is symptoms. They're symptoms of a greater problem, and those symptoms end us up costing us as producers a lot of dollars. So we need to focus on how we can get rid of those symptoms. 
1997, I had the opportunity to attend my first holistic management training, and there was a producer from Canada, Don Campbell, he's a rancher up there, and he made this statement, and it really stuck with me. He said, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And I'll never forget when he said that at that conference, because it just hit me. I was in my third year of, of crop failure. And I got thinking, I really need to change how I'm looking at things if I want to survive and stay on the farm. I came to the realization the greatest roadblock in solving a problem is the human mind. And I know there's some of you out there are sitting there, ah, this works in North Dakota, but it won't work on my place. It will work on your place. I'm 100% confident of that. It's just up to you to use the principles in the manner to allow nature to heal itself. So we really need to focus on solving problems and not treating symptoms. That's going to put more dollars in our pocket and it's going to leave our resources regenerated for the next generation. So how do we improve soil health? I found the answer in the 2008 native rangeland on our operation. If you really focus on native rangeland, you're going to see the answers if it's a healthy native rangeland ecosystem. I came to the realization that I really needed to educate myself. I didn't know how soils function. How does a healthy soil ecosystem work? And that's the journey that our family's been on ever since. You look at how nature functions. There's principles of nature that apply anywhere in the world. And those principles are the, are the same. First principle is there's no mechanical disturbance in nature. Now I realize that some of the farming practices that we do, we're going to have some disturbance on the soil. But the key is to minimize them as much as possible. Second principle is there's always armor on the soil surface. Where in nature do you see bare soils? Very seldom. You do in a few situations, but very seldom. In a healthy ecosystem, nature tries to cover. Clear case in point to that is weeds. Why do we get weeds? We get weeds because nature's trying to cover the soil. That's why. Okay, third principle, nature cycles water very efficiently. We can grow much, much more production than we think possible in a healthy ecosystem with a healthy functioning water cycle. Fourth principle is that nature cycles nutrients via biology, and we're going to talk a lot more about this over the next day and a half. The other thing is nature has thousands of years of research and development. You know, there was nobody out there putting synthetic nutrients on our native ecosystem. Nature functioned and cycled in a manner that was sustainable. Due to man's intervention, we've changed that. We need to get back to that. So I'm going to go through these five principles of a healthy soil ecosystem. And it's thing, principles that I've applied to my operation over the past 20 plus years. First principle is least amount of mechanical disturbance possible. We need to cut back on our tillage as much as possible. And we can do that. You know, yesterday we were, we were down in Alamosa speaking, and even though they grow potatoes, there's potato growers who are only doing that tillage one year. Then they're going to no-till in between the potato crops, and they're seeing a, a major impact, positive impact, on their soil resource. Now, why do we want to reduce tillage? This is the reason, and I know Jay's going to discuss this more today also, but one of the most underappreciated things we have going for us in production agriculture is mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi occur in a natural ecosystem, and what it does, it secretes the glue that starts the formation of soil particles. If you look at this soil demonstration, uh, what's holding that together? And Jay made mention of that. Those particles are being held together by those glues. You, Mycorrhizal fungi secretes glomalin. Glomalin is the sticky substance that holds those particles together. So I mentioned how when I started my soils were like that soil on the, on the right in the picture of the degraded soils. There was no soil structure to it. This is a photo we just took a couple years ago of the close-up where my single disc opener opened our soils in order to deposit the seed. 
Look at the aggregation of that soil. That aggregation is soil particles. Soil particles be, need to be formed about every four weeks. Okay? If you don't have mycorrhizal fungi, you're not going to build soil particles. If you don't build soil particles, you're not going to have soils that hold together. You're going to have erosion. How fast can we do this? The next picture I'm going to show is of an operation in eastern, uh, western Kansas. Young producer there came and listened to Ray Archuleta and myself about four years ago, and he went home to his father, and his father and him had an operation that was pretty much monoculture farming, heavy tillage. And he said, Dad, I really think we should try no-tills, cover crops, and diversity. And to his father's credit, his father said, Son, if that's what you want to do, let's try it on a part of our operation. So they took part of their operation and they converted to no-till, diversity, and covers. This is the difference after three years. Look at that change in that soil in only three years. Which of those soils is going to be like the soil on the right here and hold together? Which is going to have more life in it? Which is going to cycle nutrients? Which is going to infiltrate more water? Which is going to store more water? And in your area, that's a huge importance. You know, look at what's happening in this world today with water restrictions and the demands being put on it on water by society. You know, I know it has to be in the back of East of your minds here. What's going to happen down the road with our water? Are we going to have water? Or are they going to restrict us more and more? If they do, are you going to be ready for that? Are your soils going to be to such a state you can have adequate production with less moisture? You have to be thinking of that. The other thing mycorrhizal fungi will do, it'll actually form a symbiotic relationship with the roots and it'll extend the area in the soil from which those plants can move nutrients. So the plant on the left in this photo depicts not having mycorrhizal fungi associated with it, the plant on the right does. Dr. Christine Jones, who's one of the world's foremost soil ecologists, has told me that in many cases, there's mycorrhizal fungi that'll cover over 2,000 acres. That means all the plants in that 2,000 acres that form that symbiotic relationship have the ability to move nutrients between them and amongst them, you know. Just think of what difference that would make to your production. The other thing which is huge is that mycorrhizal fungi, actually because it forms that association with the roots, it helps ward off pests and nematodes from that plant. So if you have this in your system, your cash crop's going to be less prone to these pest problems. This is huge. We talked about this a great deal yesterday in potato production. Same thing can be said in corn production. You know, Part of the reason we're seeing all these problems in the production of our cash crops is simply because we're not taking advantage of these free things that nature can give us. So how do, we, how do we accelerate or get more mycorrhizal fungi? We need to reduce or eliminate our chemicals. We need to reduce or eliminate tillage. We need to reduce or eliminate synthetic fertilizers. And we have to have a living plant network as long as possible throughout the year. We can't have a point in time where we don't have things growing. And that's one of the things I noticed in driving up here. Now, obviously, we're in the middle of winter. but. I didn't notice a whole lot of acres with covers. There was some, and that's good, but we need more acres with covers so that we can take advantage of this. Now, in 2003, I had the good fortune, Dr. Chris Nichols, who's a soil microbiologist, came to work at the ARS station near me at Mandan, North Dakota. She came out to my place and she looked at the soils and said, Gabe, your soils will never become sustainable unless you reduce or eliminate your synthetic fertilizer. Now, I want to make this point. I'm not telling any of you to go home and reduce your, you know, eliminate your synthetic fertilizer. I am telling you, though, to do some testing and find out how much you can reduce it. Because I guarantee, over time, as you advance your soil health, you'll be able to significantly reduce your synthetic inputs. So what I did then, from 2003 to 2007, I did split trials. And I highly recommend this to every producer. We fertilized half of the field, no fertilizer on the other half. All four years, the non-fertilized was equal or greater 
as compared to the fertilized. So I, I quit all synthetic fertilizer use on our own land in 2008 and on our rented land in 2010. So later on in this presentation, I'm gonna show you some soil tests. And when you see them, just remember this, that those soil tests have come about from a result of no synthetic fertilizers on my operation. Now, second principle, armor on the soil surface. Look at nature. This is, some, this is a native prairie pasture on my operation. Look at how that soil is completely covered. There's no bare spots. So often in agriculture today, this is what we see. And I get a kick out of this photo because what good did they do that gentleman to buy a no-till drill? Look at that. There's no armor on the surface. He doesn't need to spend that money. Unfortunately, if we don't have armor on the soil surface, we end up with things like this. And you saw this in eastern Colorado just two years ago. It's not just been happening in eastern Colorado. It's happening all over North America and all over the world for that matter. A couple of years ago, my son came to me and he said, Dad, for Father's Day, I'm going to take you on a soil health tour. And they were having a soil health tour. And this is the photo that we took that day. Does that look like a healthy soil? There was no armor on that soil to protect it. Then there was no glue in those soils to hold those soils together. And we end up with erosion. This is a photo from my operation right after we seeded. And if you look close, you can see the line seven and a half inches apart where we seeded. We have virtually 100% ground cover. How much of that soil is going to erode away due to wind, due to water? It won't because we have the ground cover there. Also, how much moisture are we going to be able to hold in those soils because we're not evaporating them due to bare soils? There's the cover crop here, in this case, emerged through that just fine, but we don't get a lot of weed pressure because we have that armor. Thus, it saves us in a herbicide cost. That residue also buffers the heat, and we can get fairly hot, as I know you can, in, in the late summer months. We had a soil health uh, tour on our place one year, and Jay took these, these temperatures there. Uh, on the left, I believe it was nine, in the mid-90s that day, air temperature. On the left, that photo there depicts underneath residue, it was 87 degrees. On the right, in bare soil, it was 107 degrees. What difference does that make, you might say, about 20 degrees? Well, about 70 degrees is optimum for a plant. At 70 degrees soil temp, that plant's going to use 100% of the moisture available to it for growth. Once that temperature starts to rise, that plant shuts down. It's no longer going to produce. It's no longer going to make you money. Once our soil temps start getting up to 120, 30, 40 degrees, we're actually killing soil biology. I've been on many operations that at 150 degrees, that the soil temp, bare soil reads 150 degrees and we're killing biology in the soil. The same biology that had made nutrients available to us. We can't afford to have bare soil. Now, that day we took a spade full of soil. This is what happens underneath residue. Even though the air temperature was in the 90s, we still have active biology in the soil, providing nutrients for us. The third thing is diversity. And I just want to show, share with you a series of photos that really depict and show well the power of diversity. In 2006, Jay and I were speaking down at No Till on the Plains in Salina, Kansas. And this gentleman was speaking there. It was Dr. Adamir Caligari. Now, Dr. Caligari, in my mind, is one of the world's foremost authorities on cover crops. He works for the United Nations, and he's worked in 65 countries all over the world. He told me two things that day that really stuck in my mind. He said, you give me two inches of precipitation a year, or 200, anywhere in between, and he said, I can grow you a cover crop. Well, that told Jay and I right then and there that we can grow cover crops in Burley County, North Dakota, because we get about 16 inches of total precip a year. So we knew it would work. The other thing he said was, he said, cover crops are meant to be seeded in multi-species combinations. And I'll never forget when he said that, because Jay was sitting ahead of me a few rows, and he turned and looked at me, I looked at him. 
We both knew at that moment, how dumb are we? That's how nature works. Nature has very diverse ecosystems. Yet here we are, people thought we were crazy just planting two species in combination. We needed to diversify the mixes, our cover crop mixes. Now the Burley County Soil Conservation District had some plot land located a mile south of my operation. We decided what we'd do is we would take and test what Dr. Caligari was telling us. So we were gonna plant these cover crops as monocultures, and then we would mix the species together into a diverse mix and see what happens. Now the winter of 05, 06 was pretty open. We didn't have a lot of snow. So we went in in May and it was pretty dry soils we seeded into. By the time these photos were taken in late July, we had had just a little over an inch of precip. That's what the monoculture turnip looked like in, at the end of July. Next plot was the oil seed radish. Again, what you'd expect with no moisture, dry. So on down the line it went until we got to the diverse cover crop mix. That's what it looked like. Now you explain that to me. For years we've been told as producers you gotta plant a monoculture because they're competing for moisture. Really, does that look like that's how nature functions? <coughs> nature does not function that way. Now NRCS clipped these plots and here's what we found. We over tripled biomass where we had diversity. And Jay mentioned it this morning. This, this conference is about the power of diversity and healing our soils. We need to add diversity into our rotation. Dr. Chris Nichols explained it this way, and she's talking about mycorrhizal fungi. Not only do the fungi provide for the needs of one plant, but that fungal hyphae pipeline connect to multiple plants, thus supplying the energy and nutritional needs for multiple plants and the biology. Gets back to what I said earlier about mycorrhizal fungi. They work together in a symbiotic relationship when stressed. This, more than anything else, proved to me that monocultures are a detriment to soil health. Yet look what we're doing in production agriculture. We're trying to force our will on nature. And I don't care where you travel around the United States, whether it's wheat, in this area you'll see a lot of sweet corn I know, there's soybean areas of this country, monoculture, monoculture, monoculture. It's diversity that drives soil health. That's why we all have a degraded ecosystem. Now, what have we done on our ranch to help move away from that? Is we've diversified the crop rotation. Now, don't pay attention to the cash crops I grow. They may or may not work here. All I want to impose on you is look at the diversity I have. Every year we grow a multitude of different cash crops because we're trying to get some of each of the four crop types and we're trying to add diversity to our operation. Now we've since evolved from that into one where I no longer like to grow cash crops as monocultures. In the upper left there, that's oats with clover grown with it. The upper right, that's a mix of cool season broadleaf forage crop. The lower left, that's corn with hairy vetch growing in it. The lower right, that's sunflowers, and there's actually 19 species of covers grown with that sunflower. We're trying to add diversity in the cash crop rotation also. Now I want to tell you up front, this will kick, get you kicked out of federal crop insurance. I no longer take crop insurance. It's a hindrance to the movement and advancement of my soils to a regenerative type system. I don't need to take crop insurance anymore. We don't have to have it to farm. There's simple ways of doing this too. The fall seeded biannuals, like I mentioned earlier, the winter triticale and hairy vetch. That's diversity. You could grow crops like that here, no problem. Here's the oats. We now no longer use any fertilizers, fungicides, pesticides. I do occasionally use a herbicide because I do not want to till, but I have fields that are four years now with no herbicide, you know, and we're growing these in combination. What does it do with yields? Now, I have up there the average county yield in Burley County, North Dakota, and then my proven yields over time in Burley County. Notice that I significantly outproduce the county average. Am I the highest yielding, are my crops the highest yielding in the county? No, by no means. However, I will put the profitability of my operation up against any operation. Because we're doing it without all the inputs. And we're doing it in a way that's going to leave the resource better for the next generation. 
Fourth principle, living root in the soil as long as possible. Look how that native ecosystem functions. We get our last killing frost sometime around mid-May. We get our first one in the fall and early September. I used to think that short window was my growing season. That's not how nature functions. I can go out to my native prairie ecosystem and in early April, as soon as the snow melts, we're gonna have crocuses and other plants growing. There's gonna be other species that grow well into early winter. Nature tries to put a living root in the soil as long as possible. We need to mimic that in our crop production. That is the reason I do things like, oh, excuse me, this is saying that this computer needs to be plugged in. Can somebody get a cord up here? Or we're gonna lose power pretty quick. Okay, that's the reason that I plant things like that clover with the oats. Once I scrape combine off that oats, that clover is growing longer throughout the period, throughout the year, taking sunlight through photosynthesis, converting it into liquid carbon. Corn and hairy vetch, the same thing. Try to have something growing as long as you can throughout the season. If not hairy vetch, this is turnips and radishes in a corn crop. Once we combine off that corn, those species proliferate, and then what they also do is allow us more forage for the livestock throughout the winter. We graze our livestock as long as we can throughout the winter. It, we used to feed for over six months out of the year. If my operation was continuous altogether, there was ze there's zero doubt in my mind that I could graze year round. Now, as it is, we have housing developments around us, and I just can't afford for those cattle to be on the other side of a housing development during a snowstorm. You don't want that call that there's 300 cows under the neighbor's deck. That's not a good call to get. So we have to move them closer to home, so we run out of grazing. The last four or five years, we've been feeding hay about 60 days a winter. So we can make it a long, long time due to principles like this. The other thing it allows us, you know, we tend to get a lot of snow, as you do as I know you do too. That snow allows us to graze acreage where we don't have water because our cows will do just fine on snow and we winter them on as such. Now, we'll use a lot of cover crops on our operation in order to get this living root in the ground for as long as possible. These are just some of the species I used this past year. Don't pay attention to the species. They may or may not work for you. You need to try that yourself. But pay attention to the diversity. I have some of all four crop type. We're trying to feed the soil a diverse diet. So we grow different species. And I'll, this, this afternoon's presentation, I'll talk about how to put cover crop mixes together in order to address resource concerns. We have about 2,000 acres of cropland. We grow a, cat, a cover crop on 90% of those acres, along with a cash crop every year. We grow that cover crop either before the cash crop, along with it, or in the case of fall biannuals, after the cash crop. Now we take about 10% of our cropland acres every year and we devote them to what we call full season cover crops. And we convert that to cash by grazing livestock on it. But we do that in order to enhance the soil life on those acres. I consider a cover crop to be a biological primer. And what that is, a biological primer is a diverse cover crop that enhances the life and the function of the soil. So we're adding diversity in order to enhance soil life. And when, you, when you're going to do plant a cover crop, the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, what's my resource concern? You know, don't go just planting a cover crop for the sake of having a cover crop. What are you trying to do on those acres? Are you trying to improve infiltration? Are you trying to store more water? Are you trying to get armor on the surface? Are you trying to increase your organic matter? What are you trying to do? Then you can design the mix, and I'll talk more about that this afternoon. One of the easiest ways to do that is with fall biannuals, and I'll run through a little scenario here. Now, there's many things you can do with fall biannuals, and I'll get into that later today. In this particular case, our resource concern was we didn't have armor on the surface. And I, if I don't have armor, I'm not protecting my soil and I'm evaporating water. So I purposely let this fall biannual get to a higher carbon state. If I was going for maximum gain on the livestock, I'd never let this crop, this, 
this fall biannual get that mature. But instead, we wanted the armor. So what we were doing was going in there with high stock densities. We were putting about 368 yearlings in a small group on about a sixth of an acre. In other words, we were grazing them at about 700,000 pounds of live weight per acre. We were moving them multiple moves per day. And that's the kind of armor that we'd have left over on the soil surface. They were only eating about 25% of that. They were trampling the rest, but that's what we wanted to address our resource concern. We can go from this to that, a dead dying plant, in a matter of three or four days. Because those cattle trampled it, thus terminating that fall biannual, then we're able to seed another diverse mix in there. And that picture again depicts just what that was like. Now, what are we gonna seed into there? We're gonna seed a very, very diverse mix. This is what it looks like, and I always get the question, how do you get that through the drill? Real easily, just open it so the larger seed can fall through. It's a cover crop, it doesn't have to be exact. The important thing is to get some diversity in there and get it growing. How do the small seeds come up? They come up just fine, they follow the large seeds. It really works a lot better than one might think. This is what that particular mix was. Again, don't pay attention to the species, just pay attention to the diversity. If I was to seed these covers as monocultures, it'd take me 19 years to do what I do in one year. We're accelerating biological time. We're feeding that soil a very diverse diet. Now, we're doing this at the hot time of the year, so most of the species are gonna be warm season. I throw a few cool season species in there in case we get a real cool uh, summer and fall. But I have diversity, I have the ability to do that. And the thing is, each year will be a little different. Some of these species will be better than, will perform better than the others. We're also optimizing solar energy collection. As producers, how do we make our money? We make our money converting sunlight into dollars, right, through photosynthesis. That's what we do. No matter if we're producing sweet corn or fruit, vegetables, doesn't matter, that's what we're doing, or forage for our livestock. If you grow monocultures, you only have one leaf size or shape out there. If you grow diverse polycultures, you have many different leaf sizes and shapes. You're going to maximize solar energy collection. You're going to maximize photosynthesis, thus putting more dollars into your pocket. It all begins with photosynthesis. The more photosynthesis, the more liquid carbon you're pumping into the system. And we'll talk more about it. Now, within a matter of about six to eight weeks, that cover crop I see that will look like this with very little moisture. Because we have the armor, and we don't have any irrigation. You people here who have irrigation have a real benefit in that you, you're guaranteed some water to be able to put on there. We don't have that guarantee, but we can still grow covers like this because of soil health. And what we're doing with these diverse covers is we're feeding everything. We're feeding the biology in the soil. We're feeding wildlife. We're also feeding insects, and so often people think, oh, I don't want insects. They're pests. They'll hurt my cash crop. No, there, there's many, many beneficial insects. We have a lot of pollinator species. Those pollinators add value to our crop. We also formed an agreement with an apiary. They, they set beehives around our place. We purchase the honey from them, from those hives, and then we market it under our branded label, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow, and thus at putting more dollars in our pocket. So the insects are benefiting us financially. There's also many, many predator insects, and as producers, so often we don't realize this. Instead, when we see a pest, an insect out there, we want to go kill this pest. Dr. Jonathan Lundgren, who I understand was here a couple of years ago, told me this. For every insect species that's a pest, there's 1,700 that are beneficial. So as producers, we want to go kill that pest when we should be concerned about providing a home and habitat for all those predators that eat that pest. Then you don't have to write the check. This is huge. You know, and I don't care if we're, you're producing vegetables or fruit or sweet corn. This can happen on all operations. Take advantage of nature, it's free. All you have to do is supply the home for it. On our operation, we have what we call pollinator strips, but what they really are is a home for those predator insects and also the pollinators. We try and have flowering species 
on our operation throughout the year. Now I mentioned uh, we have an agreement with that Avery. They found that they got 19% higher honey production on the hives on our operation as compared to the, their other hives. The reason is, is because we have these flowering species, these pollinator strips available to those bees throughout the growing season. It's a benefit to them, it's a benefit to us. More money in our pocket. We have not used a pesticide since before the turn of the century with the exception of some treat treatment on seed corn which we quit in 2010. Once I found out the danger of neonicotinoids and what they were doing in the system, we quit that. We use only heirloom and organic seeds because of it. We haven't used a fungicide since before the turn of the century. I can honestly say I have not spent two minutes in the past 15 years worrying about a pest on our operation because the predators are going to take care of it. There will be ebbs and flows a little bit, but it never reaches an economically detrimental level. The reason producers have a pest problem is because they have a lack of diversity. We cause this to ourselves. We bring this upon ourselves when we have problems. You have to supply a home. Fifth principle of soil health is animal impact. You know, how did these soils form over eons of time? In this area, there was large herds, elk, deer, and I know there still is. There was predators that were moving them. There was local residents, rabbits, grasshoppers, etc. You have to nowadays provide an opportunity to integrate grazing livestock into our systems. How we do that on our operation? We raise grass-finished beef. We grow these cover crops. I mentioned to you we put covers on 10% of our cropland acres as a full season cover every year. We convert that to dollars by grass finishing livestock on there. Or we let it go, and there's a picture. This photo was taken in early November. We probably froze 40, 50 times by then. But look at we still have plants that are growing. Some of these plants are very frost tolerant. Take advantage of that. We're collecting sunlight, putting more carbon into the system, and then, then during the winter, we convert it to dollars by grazing livestock. It's much, much cheaper to let the livestock graze than it is to bale the hay. We do not provide our cattle with a bed and breakfast. They have four legs for a reason. Make them use them. There's absolutely no reason that cattle can't forage for themselves most of the winter. I understand there's occasions with ice storms or if you get 50 inches of snow at a time dumped on you, but it's for a very short time. Now when we graze livestock during the winter, we're not going to allow them to graze that cover crop down to the ground. It's not going to happen. We're going to make sure we leave armor on the soil surface because that's going to protect us from weeds, it's going to protect that soil from wind erosion, water erosion, evaporation, etc., etc. Now I'm going to show you what I consider one of the fallacies of the current production model and how things are being done. This photo here was taken off a particular cropland field. This soil test is from that field. In the upper left hand corner, I know you can't read it, it says pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds. How much corn, how many bushels of corn can you grow on 10 units of end? I'll show you what I can do. Here we are planting into that residue. When I say I'm a no-tiller, I'm a no-tiller. On your left is planted, on the right is not. I don't use trash whippers, that's way too much tillage. I realize for furrow irrigation, you're gonna have to have some bare ground where that, uh, where that furrow is, but we can minimize that and make it not the whole field. There's a close-up picture of us planting into that heavy trash. Today's equipment has the ability to do that. And I really dislike the term trash. It's not trash, it's residue, and it's food for biology. Now, we can go from this much residue, and Jay Fear actually took these photos, so I have a witness right here. Here we are, we plant corn about mid-May. On the left is June 16th, on the right is July 1st. What's happening to my residue? I'm certainly not out there cultivating. I'm way too lazy to do that. Those of you, those who know me know that I'm allergic to work. I just don't like to work. Let nature do the work for me. Now, we did not apply any synthetics at all. We didn't apply compost, no compost tea. You know, nothing's been applied to this. Here's what that corn crop looks like then come fall. 
at tasseling time. Dr. Ray Ward, who owns Ward Labs at Kearney, Nebraska, come and did a leaf tissue analysis on that corn. The top line is nitrogen. It's in the high category. How can I have a soil test that says 10 units of N, yet my leaf tissue analysis shows that I have plenty of nitrogen? Everything he tested for was satisfactory or above. I have not added a single thing since 2008 on this particular field. Our corn average 142 bushels per acre. This is dry land. County average is a little under 100. That's pretty good. It's the biology. The biology makes the nutrients available to us. If you were to brush aside the cover crops on my operation, that's what you'd see. I don't know how well that shows up, but that's solid earthworm casting. The biology in the soil will cycle nutrients for you. Now, there's a soil scientist at ARS in Temple, Texas, by the name of Dr. Rick Haney. Dr. Haney developed a test. It's commonly known as the Haney test. What it accurately does is it tests how much water extractable organic carbon is in soil. And what that is, that's the food for biology. So you can send a soil sample to Ward Labs at Kearney, Nebraska, or there's other labs around that'll do it. Have them run a Haney test, and it will, it will give you a real good indication as to the amount of nutrients you will have available to your plants via the biology. The soil tests that are being done by so many places today are only a snapshot in time, and they're not giving any credit to the biology. If you have a good agronomist, he needs to know this, and he should be looking out for your best interest, and he be, should be doing this test. Here's Dr. Haney's contact information. He's done over 22,000 samples in the United States. There's accurate data on this. It's worth doing. There's a lot of producers who are using this as a tool to wean themselves off of synthetics. As your soil becomes healthier, as biology proliferates, you'll be able to cycle more nutrients through. Use this test to your advantage. Now, I haven't grown a lot of corn since 2012, but I put this up there. This is all my income and expenses on a corn crop since 2012. Now, this is not sweet corn, it's field corn. What I want you to pay attention to, your costs will vary, and in 2012, I was still using crop insurance, that's why it's up here. We have dropped out of that program now. But look at the, my cost to produce a bushel of corn that year, $1.44. Last year, locally, corn fell to $1.87 a bushel because our basis is so wide. I can still make money at that. There's not many producers that can. I could care less about yield. There's producers in our county that will out-yield me every year. But I'll compare the profit per acre of my operation against any of them. It's not how much yield you get. It's how much can you, dollars can you put in your pocket and what have you done for the resource? Growing topsoil is a biological process, and we can grow topsoil. 85 to 90 percent of plant nutrient acquisition comes about via the microbes. It's the biology in the soil that determines how healthy our plants are, unless you're feeding it all of the synthetics that it needs. You don't want to do that. It costs you money and it's detrimental to soil health, as I'll show coming up. Okay, but who feeds the microbes and with what? Plants feed the microbes with liquid carbon. It all comes down to collecting sunlight, photosynthesis, translocated through the plant to the roots, and then leaked out, and that's what the biology eat. And then as they, their life cycle plays out, that's what feeds the plants. Nature took care of all this for us. We just have to take advantage of it. And of all the night microbes important to humification, mycorrhizal fungi are king. That's why I talked about mycorrhizal fungi, and I know Jay will talk about it also over the next day. Now, what have we done on our operation? I mentioned that on our cropland acres, we were less than 2% organic matter when we started. We're at 6% or above today. We've, we're continuing to increase. What's that worth? Just from a nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur standpoint, and potassium, 1% organic matter equates to about $750 worth of nutrients. In other words, 5% organic matter soils, that's $3,700 of nutrients. 
Does it pay for us as producers to pay attention to organic matter levels? You bet. Now, in traveling here yesterday and visiting this morning, I know most of the producers in this room have organic matter levels less than 2%. If you get that to 3%, 4%, what difference is that going to make to your bottom line? How many more dollars will you be able to keep in your pocket? Significant amount. We need to pay attention to that. Now I'm going to show you the differences between four different production models here. We had a team of scientists to our operation this past fall, and they took these photos and ran this data. So these four producers, all located within a mile of my operation, okay? The first one's an organic producer. He has a pretty high diversity. He grows corn and peas and beans and wheat and barley and oats and alfalfa and triticale and rye and clover. Very diverse operation, but heavy, heavy tillage. That's a picture of his soils this year in one of his sunflower fields. See that capping on the surface, that light cover? How's water gonna infiltrate through that? You see that platiness of the soil structure? How are the roots going to be able to move down through that? That's his soil. The next operation is a no-till operation with very low diversity. Likes to grow flax and spring wheat, that's about it. This spring, the, we had a rainfall event, three and a half inches in 45 minutes, it washed his spring wheat crop away and he had to plant sunflowers. That's why there's sunflowers in the background. Look at that soil there. There's really no difference between him and the organic producer. You'd think it's the same soil. Same thing, it's capped on the surface, it can't infiltrate the platy structure. There's also no life in that soil, you don't see earthworms. Third producer, long time no till. Pretty fair diversity, he likes to grow corn and malting barley and sunflowers and some spring wheat and some soybeans. But high, high use of synthetic fertilizers. High use, fungicides, pesticides, all the time. Look at that soil. I'd contend that's almost as bad as the tilled soil, but they're all the same. There's not a bit of difference between any of them. So no-till is not the total answer. It's a piece of the pie and it'll move you in the right direction, but that producer hasn't taken advantage of coverage. He hasn't reduced his synthetic inputs, so his soils are still degraded. Here's a picture of my soils, no-till. High diversity because I grow all those cash crops and cover crops, plus I integrate livestock into it. Zero synthetics. Look at that soil. Am I going to be able to infiltrate more water? How much more biology is in that soil? Look at the aggregation of that soil. We can grow topsoil. Now, Dr. Rick Haney at Temple, Texas ran the soil tests on these. That's the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from each of these four producers. Mine is on the bottom there. Look at that. I have 281 pounds of nitrogen. I don't have to apply any. It's available because of nature. And people ask me, yeah, but Gabe, you're going to run out of phosphorus and potassium. You can get the nitrogen from the atmosphere. What about phosphorus and potassium? Where does it come from? It comes from root exudates and biology breaking down the unavailable fractions, in other words, rock formed, and making it available. The nutrient levels on my soils are increasing all the time because of that. When will I run out? I don't know, millions of years? Nature functioned over eons of time and it didn't run out. Why do we think we ran out now? We're just not taking advantage of these principles to make the nutrients available to us. Soil carbon is the key driver for the nutritional status of plants and therefore the mineral density in animals and people. And tomorrow I'm gonna to talk about that. So often us as producers do not talk about nutrient densities of our product. We're gonna be able to capitalize on nutrient dense foods and we already are on our operation and tomorrow I'll get into how we market our products that we produce from our operation and how financially we're taking advantage of that. Soil is a key driver for the Soil moisture holding capacity, which is frequently the most limiting uh, factor in production agriculture. In my mind, soil carbon is the key driver for farm profit. Is your agronomist talking to you about soil carbon? If not, fire him, get a new one. Because soil carbon will determine your profitability. Now I'm gonna run through an example of, of uh, 
uh, a scenario that happened back on our operation. I have a neighbor who loves to till. And every fall since 1983, he's gone out and tilled the slow spot. What happens in the spring then, we'll get a rain event, and after a half inch, he, that's drowning out because he can't infiltrate it. He destroyed the pore spaces, like Jake talked about here. This is a photo I took off the front deck of my house on June 15, 2009. The weather service was forecasting a major rainfall event, which usually means half an inch our, our way, but it started raining at 5.30 in the evening. Jay came out the next day, we had seen 13.6 inches of rain in 22 hours. Jay took this photo himself, and he can describe this to you if you ask him. But that's what my soils look like after 13.6 inches of rain. Now, I'm a little embarrassed, there's a few spots where the residue uh, washed away because there is quite a bit of slope going up there to my farm here. But that doesn't look bad. He took this photo also. This is a spade full of soil. Does that look like it had 13.6 inches of rain on it? And I'm not going to kid you, at that time we weren't able to infiltrate at all, but we infiltrated a great part of it. And the armor protecting that soil held that soil from being washed away. I mentioned when we purchased that operation, we could infiltrate a half of an inch per hour. Today, we're well over 15 inches per hour. In fact, I have a team of scientists in there, and we'll see if this works. Oops. Ah, I guess it's not going to play. Oh, there it goes. That's an inch of water being infiltrated into our soils. What they found is I can now infiltrate the first inch in nine seconds, the second inch in 16 seconds. Two inches in 25 seconds. We can do this to any soil just by following these principles. It's not how much rainfall you get, how much water you're able to put on with irrigation, it's how much can you infiltrate into your soils and then hold there via organic matter. 1% organic matter in the top eight, six inches of soil can hold about 25 to 27,000 gallons of water. You can go to your local NRCS and ask them to look through web soil survey and figure that out for your operation. Figure out how, what is your water holding capacity or your soil. When I started out our operation, our whole farm could hold 190 million gallons of water. Today we can easily hold 700 million gallons of water. I tell people often we create our own drought. It's not how much moisture you get, it's how much can you infiltrate and hold. We are our own worst enemy due to our management practices. Now this might be a little hard to see, but what this is, it's water holding capacity according to soil types per foot of the soil profile. The middle column there is silt loam soils. That's what I have. When I started out in 91, we, had less, we could hold less than two inches of water per foot of the soil profile. Today we can easily hold four to five inches of water per foot of soil profile. In other words, in a four foot profile, I can hold over 20 inches of water. I no longer have to worry about drought. My soils are resilient. I can hold them. A one or two year drought does not affect my operation at all. If we were to get into extended drought, then I'd have to make some management decisions based on that. But healthy soil means resiliency. You're able to withstand those swings. So, all of these practices I've shared with you this morning are just like a staircase. And here's what we did on our operation. When we started out in 1991, we had very shallow topsoils. We had low organic matter levels. As we diversified the cash crops, there was a step up. Then we added cover crops. Things got healthier. Then we started to really integrate the livestock, and things got even better. Now, whoops, I went the wrong direction. Now, 2013, we actually have a plot of land we built to 11.1% organic matter. And we've done this without buying any synthetics. It's by focusing on capturing sunlight and putting more carbon into the system. That's what that soil looks like now. We can regenerate our landscapes if we apply our minds to it. Now I'll just give a tease for tomorrow's presentation. This is how my family and I capture sunlight Convert it into carbon and then drive our profit centers. And we have a lot of diversity on our operation, and that what, that's what uh, helps our operation be resilient to downtrends in prices for any particular 
a product. It's all about taking advantage of nature and the principles she had. We are not profitable every year regardless of price. We like setting our own price. We like making our own markets. Our favorite motto is we enjoy signing the back of the check and not the front. Uh, that's a good motto. It's an enjoyable one. One's ability to be successful with regenerative agriculture is directly related to one's understanding of how healthy ecosystems function. We need to understand healthy ecosystems. That's what it's about, is healthy ecosystems. With that, there's my contact information. Feel free to contact me at any time. I take emails and phone calls, and I try really hard to answer them all. If I don't answer the phone call, it's because I'm up here speaking in front of a group. But I will get back to you. So I don't know, Mike, if we have time for questions, but we do. We do. OK. Any questions? I'll repeat them, so somebody raise a hand. Yes, sir. 